Hey everybody. So this is a pre-pre-con message for those of you who are going to be attending the, the flipped learning with Google tools session at the, at the My Google conference coming up soon. And what I want to do in this video is introduce you to the concept of flipped learning, go over some of the basics so that way on Monday when we're together we'll be able to go over more of the, the applications and the, the hands-on pieces. Um, but let me introduce myself first. My name is Dan Spencer. I'm one of the ed tech consultants at the Jackson County ISD. And before I moved over to the ISD, I was uh, teaching high school chemistry, physics, and engineering over at Michigan Center High School in the Jackson area. And about 2008 is when I really started flipping my classroom and had some amazing things that happened. And really want to be able to share those with you and, and kind of figure out how we can make this work in your own particular situation. Now, what I want to do here is just kind of set the stage because I'm really looking forward to this. We've got three hours and I want to model the flipped process as much as possible and that's kind of why we're doing this whole, whole video but also um, I, I really want to make sure that this is hands-on there's not going to be a whole lot of you sitting listening to me um, so I want you to like I said I want you to watch this video and uh, there, it's also attached to a, a Google form so if you could fill out those survey questions and submit that that's going to help me know how to make sure that, that you have the the right equipment and the right uh, the right the right stuff there um, so let's let's get into this back in 2008 when I started flipping my classroom there was a reason that I, I wanted to do this that the the reason I'm showing you these pictures of my students is because I was in a really tough situation I was in a situation where I had 32 to 35 kids in a class and I was the chemistry department and I had kids that were going on full ride academic scholarships to Big Ten schools I had other kids there that were reading at a five or a fifth grade level and somehow I had to be able to meet all of their needs and the problem was that when I was first teaching um, chemistry I was doing a lot of me in front of the classroom me talking at my 32 kids and hopefully they were all nodding their heads and saying yes and but when it came down to it they really weren't understanding things and because I had such a wide variety of, of students the whole idea of trying to get them to to do this one size fits all model just it, it wasn't working and I was getting frustrated they were getting frustrated and I really needed to find some ways to to change that and that's when I started hearing and, and doing this idea of, of flipped learning in my classroom now really when it comes down to to flipped learning done right there's you gotta understand there's lots of different ways that you can do this in your classroom so what I did might not be exactly what you do and that's okay but there's a few key points that are really important what I was looking at was I, I was really frustrated with how my class time was being used and I really wanted to figure out okay what's the most effective use of that class time what I wanted to do is I wanted to transfer that ownership of the learning process off of me and put that on my students. I wanted them to be able to control the pace. I wanted them to have choices in how they learned and what they learned. And that just wasn't happening in this one size fits all model that, that I had created. Um, I also wanted to be available for my students when they needed my help the most. I, I taught in a district that um, a lot of kids were going home and they didn't have somebody that could help them with their chemistry problems. So. When, when that happened it usually meant that they were checking out and I needed to find a way where when they were at that point of struggle I could swoop in help them out be right next to them and get them through that process uh, and, and kind of figure out okay what things was I doing that maybe they didn't need me right there and then figure out how to swap those two so that's really the big question is what's the most effective use of your class time and how can you find ways to have more of that in your or when you're working with your students and here's what I was doing I mean this is this is Bloom's taxonomy you could use this with any of those learning models but what was happening in my classroom with my chemistry kids is I was spending so much time trying to push content onto them and the low blooms taxonomy stuff like the the understanding and the remembering 
that we didn't have time to go over the application and those higher order thinking skills that I wanted to get to. But the worst problem was that while I was telling all of my students in one big group, hey, we're gonna learn this together, I was then sending them off to do the harder application pieces on their own. And there was a lot of frustration all around. What flipping allowed me to do was to do the, the, the low end blooms, the, the just the kind of the direct instruction, this is how you do this, this is how you do that, this is the background, all of that kind of stuff. It let them do that at their own pace. So the kids who uh, excelled, they could go fast through that and, and be just fine. The kids who needed some more help, maybe they needed to see something two, three times, they could do that. The important part was flipping allowed them to do the basics at their own pace. And then when we were having that face-to-face -face time in class, we could spend that doing, or we could do that um, together as a group and, and creating that, that synergy that, that really makes the, the learning process a, a social event. So here's technically um, what we've come up with as the definition for flipped learning. Now, I, I helped the Flipped Learning Network in creating this. The, the main idea with, with flipping is that we take those direct instruction pieces, the, the lectures, the examples, the, the stuff that um, we're just kind of going step by step or explaining things, and we're moving that to the individual learning space. We're letting students do that at their own pace. That may be in class, that may be out of class. That's, that, that's not the most important piece. The important part is that they're doing it at their own pace. And then what happens is we take that classroom experience where we're everybody's together and we, we change that around. We make that more dynamic, more interactive, where they're doing those higher order thinking skills in a social environment. Um, so what I want to do here is just give you three very basic examples of what I call the flipped spectrum understand that there are a lot of different flavors to flipping and we can we can kind of find what's going to work best for you um, what I want you to do is take a look at this and see where you think you might want to dip your toes in when it comes to to flipping your classroom so the most basic and kind of where I started was the idea of, of taking content taking that direct instruction uh, turning those into videos that students could access anytime. And what I, as I created those videos, um, I started building up this content library where all of the stuff that I had gone over throughout the year, it was available on my, on my YouTube channel. And the great thing that happened there is there was some remediation that, that was allowed to happen that I couldn't have done before. So for example, uh, a lot of kids who were studying for a test, they now could go back and rewatch those videos, uh, go over some of the, the things that they may have missed. Some of my kids who really struggled in class, they were now able to watch those videos a few times before they uh, were doing homework problems and a lot of stuff in between. So the idea of having content that's available for students to go back to as needed is a really valuable way to start flipping your classroom. The next kind of level of, of flipping is what I call flipped 101. This is typically what you see um, when, you, when you hear about uh, flipping for the first time. The idea of flipping what happens in the classroom and what happens at home. Uh, a lot of teachers have done this by rather than lecturing during class, they create these videos, have students watch them at home, and then class time is now spent doing what used to be homework. And that goes back to the whole idea of being available when students need your help the most. Now, there's a lot of things I like about this. There's also a lot of things that, that I don't. Um, and I, I will be the first person to tell you that this is not the silver bullet for all that's wrong in education. Um, what I do believe is that this idea of, of flipping what happens in the classroom and what happens at home is a great way to start but it's not where you want to finish. So we will talk more about this on Monday, uh, but the next one along that flip spectrum that, that made the most difference in my classroom was what was called flip mastery. This is 
where we, well, the problem I was having in my classroom was that we we're getting a lot of the Swiss cheese effect. The idea that all of my students, because we were all going through at the exact same time, whether my students understood it not or, or not, we were moving on. So for a lot of my students, they were having gaps in their understanding of chemistry and physics, um, but we were still pressing on. And the problem happened is that even though they didn't understand things, because we were moving on, and I was expecting them to understand those things, they were running into problems. So flipped mastery is the idea of letting students go at their own pace, where they are able to proceed through the, through the content as needed as long as they can stop along the way and show that they've understand it, or that they understand things, show that they've mastered the, the content before proceeding or before moving on. Um, that was something that took me a few years to get to, but it was really interesting when it, it finally happened because once again, the, my kids had their autonomy. They had ownership of the learning process. And the best part, and I should probably say that this works for all of those things, the best part was that I was able, I, I was kind of untethered from the, the front of my classroom. Because the content was available for all of my kids, what I could now do is spend that class time moving around and talking to my to my students. My goal was to talk to every single student every day. Some days it happened, some days it didn't. But the beauty of that is that I started having conversations and building relationships that I wasn't before. And and, and that's where I really saw the most gain with my students. It wasn't the videos that were doing the magic. The, the, what was happening was those videos were a, allowing me to have more one-on-one -on -one conversations with my students, to be able to figure out when they're getting stuck, to be able to, to kind of help do that remediation piece when they need it, to be able to push them and ask questions that in the past I didn't have time for. Now, that's a really fast explanation of what's happened over like the past six years. Um, but I just wanted that to be uh, an introduction to some different ways that you could flip your classroom. What I wanna do now is just talk briefly about some technology considerations that you need to have in place, or at least, like I said, consider uh, before you set up your classroom or as you're setting up your classroom. So the first one is where is your content going to come from? Are you, going to, are you going to look for content videos that have already been created? Or are you going to create them yourself? And if you are gonna create your content, how are you gonna do it? What kind of, what equipment are you going to need? How are you going to set that, set that up so that you are able to create that content for your students? Another consideration that, that you need to think of is, as you create your own content or as you find content from, well, as you create your own content, where are you gonna put that? If I make a video, I have to, I'm not gonna email that out to all of my students. I have to have that in some place where students can get to that easily. And so things like YouTube and Google Drive are fantastic uh, repositories for hosting video content. Another consideration is once you've created that content, along with all the other things that you have going on, how are you gonna organize that? Are you gonna create a website? Are you gonna do a Google site? Are you going to use Google Classroom or Edmodo or Moodle or Schoology or any of these other um, sites that, that allow you to organize that, that content? What you need is a one-stop shop for your students to be able to get go there, find what they need anytime. And the other consideration that you need to think about is how are your students going to access that, that content? Are they going to be doing it during class? If so, are they going to be using their own cell phones? Are they going to be using uh, devices that you supplied? What happens when they go home? What do they have uh, available to them? So we'll, we'll talk more in detail about that on Monday, but it's just something that you need to think about as you start to do this. Uh, so here's what I want you to expect on Monday. Now that I've given you a very brief background in what flipping looks like, uh, we're going to talk about some more kind of um, grade level specific and content area specific examples of flipping in the classroom. So my, my expertise is in high school uh, science, but we're going to talk about 
how this is being done in elementary school, how this is being done in ELA, foreign languages, math, all, you name it, we'll be able to, to um, tweak it to work in your situation. We're gonna spend some time uh, going over resources so that you can find quality content that's already been created. I, I'm a big believer that you don't reinvent the wheel, so use what other people have already created as you get started. But it's also important that you know how to create your own content because you have a relationship with your students that some guy on, on YouTube uh, isn't going to have. And that's something that, that's valuable. So we're gonna talk about how you can create your own content. And then I'm gonna give you time to choose what it is you want to work on. Do we wanna start talking about how you set up your YouTube site? Do we wanna talk about getting Google Classroom set up or uh, classroom management or other things like that? You're gonna have a lot of time to be able to choose. So when you come on Monday, I want you to bring an idea for uh, a content video that you could create. Maybe it's just a tutorial, something, something short, some idea where kids get stuck and you it would be really valuable to have a video that would say, hey, watch this and then let me know if you still have questions. Um, so along with bringing that idea for your video, bring a device that has a microphone. So it might be a laptop, uh, it might be a Chromebook, it might be an iPad or an Android tablet. Whatever it is, bring, bring something. And if you have multiple things, bring those too. And also have an idea about where it is you want to, to start working. It, in order to, to flip your classroom, where do you need to start? And like I said, we'll, we'll talk more about that. So I hope this, uh, this helps you know what to expect when we meet on Monday. I'm really looking forward to, to meeting all of you, working with you shoulder to shoulder, and getting you going with flipping your classroom. Thanks.